Okay. Um, so I'm talking about WTO and free movement of persons in the WTO. And I'm going to do this uh, essentially by uh, maybe a little bit boringly just setting out the framework um, for uh, what one gets out of the WTO. And I'm going to illustrate this uh, with reference to the EU's commitments on free movement of persons to the outside world, which might be us soon. Um, so this is, as everybody knows, the default in case there's no agreement um, between the UK and the EU, which is not impossible at all, and in fact may even be desirable. The way that the WTO deals with free movement of persons is in the General Agreement on Trade in Services, GATS, um, which dates from 1995, and which, for those, I, I don't know how much people know, so I'll just give the basics. It the, the, the stuff going on behind which I think is somebody else's computer. No, it means it's, 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 it's Cyrus Mann behind us working on that. Oh, I don't have a presentation. Oh, I, I don't like them. I, I'm, I'm going to have <laughs> some, <laughs> just the, just basically just some okay. provisions, that's all. Um, so the GATS operates in parallel to the GATT, and it does similar, or tries to do similar sorts of things, a bit mutatis mutandis, as one has to do for services. And it establishes four modes, they're called in jargon, modes of supply. Um, Cross-border, that's the one which was an EU competence in Opinion 194. Uh, consumption abroad, that's tourists, students, so on consuming in other countries, of no relevance um, to us really at the moment. Uh, commercial presence, which is what EU lawyers would call establishment, um, and I as an international lawyer would call investment in services. And then the one we're interested in, which is um, movement of persons. And that is defined in Article 1, Paragraph 2D, which is there, and those are the modes, supply of a service by a service supplier of one member through presence of natural persons of a member in the territory of any other member. So there's a lot of members going on there. Um, the key concept is that the natural persons that we're interested in here are relevant through their presence in another WTO member. So this means two things. Um, and I think Catherine mentioned these two options in the beginning. One is that the natural persons can be service suppliers in their own right, so all of us when we do our teaching in other um, universities around the world. Um, but also natural persons can be involved in the supply of services through their work for another service supplier. It doesn't have to be of their nationality either. Um, and that could be a company, a juridical person in WTO jargon, or of course um, could in theory be another natural person. And this is all specified a little bit in more detail in an annex on the movement of natural persons, which is... Uh, who's in control of this? Uh, no one. No one. Right. Yeah, there are only two pages. I'm just going to have to flick from one to the other a bit, so I mean, I can do it. Yeah. Okay. How does it work? Like that? It's just this Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, well, it's a bit small, but anyway. Um, paragraph one is what we're looking at now, um, which, uh, as you can see, just details what I said. Those are two different... Um, aspects. One detail on this annex is that it doesn't actually specify that the service supplier has to be a, a national of a WTO member other than the one in which the services are being supplied. So some people have seized on this and said, well, GATS is a sort of all-round immigration agreement. Um, you know, it applies to you yourself. It's obviously ridiculous um, because this is only about a definition that applies to the annex. It doesn't apply to the GATS. But you know, academics, they will get excited sometimes. Um, so, let's just ignore that. <laughs> WTO lawyers are surprisingly easily excitable. We take what we can get. Um, so, before getting more stuck into the legal aspects, just a brief word on uh, the political and economic dimensions of Mode 4. And we're coming at this from the completely opposite uh, side of a spectrum than one does if one is moving from EU law to, you know, some sort of FTA concept. And WTO is way on the other side of this, uh, which is, you know, um, uh, that there is nothing 
essentially, unless you want there to be something. So the idea of mode four as being something, even as a framework, was something that was quite hotly contested in the 1990s leading up to 1995 when this agreement um, uh, dates. The developed countries wanted to limit this to skilled workers, golden collar workers, maybe some high end white collar workers, and developing countries obviously wanted this potentially to include everything, you know, seasonal agricultural labour and uh, working in uh, construction, uh, hotel, whatever. You know? uh, so essentially they wanted this to be a framework for an immigration agreement. And on this particular point, the developing countries won, which is why you have um, mode four without any limitation on the sorts of services that are covered. And if I, from personal experience, people in the European Commission um, have missed this point, some of them, because they assume that it's just white-collar workers, golden-collar workers. Now, as I'll explain in a moment, that is true in terms of EU commitment, but it's not true in terms of the GATS, it's not true in terms of what you can do in the GATS. Um, I'm a bit surprised to hear that, but you know, uh, I guess people don't always update themselves, do they? Now, the... Um, uh, idea that you can negotiate, make commitments on any sorts of services, in other words, any sort of um, uh, uh, immigration, right, uh, if we can call it that, uh, is further elaborated in paragraph three here. Uh, members may negotiate specific commitments applying to the movements of all categories. All categories is the important thing there, right? So you can, as a WTO member, make a commitment on seasonal labour if you want. Um, perfectly possible. All looking very good for the developing countries, but it was a partial victory for several reasons, because developed countries always win in the end. Um, and one is that in this annex, if you look at paragraph two, you can see a fairly big limitation on what was in the main body of the agreement. In fact, this redefines the agreement to exclude um, permanent movement of persons in any way. So it's now very clear that we're dealing with what is, uh, we're dealing with temporary movement of persons. So you can see there in paragraph two um, how that is done. Um, all of uh, you know, citizenship, residence, permanent employment is excluded from the GATS. So that's typically the way you um, teach the developing countries a lesson. You give them a lot in the header and then you take it all away again in a footnote. So that's the politics of where we are at the moment. Um, and I'll explain how the GATS uh, then operates. This is just the definition, right? But it doesn't actually mean anything yet. It's just what's possible. A small point on the economics, um, before I get into the whole commitment side of things, is that mode four amounts to about 1% of trade-in services. Okay? So it's insignificant, which gives you another sense of um, who won that particular tussle. And what is that 1%? Well, I'll get to that now. What does it all mean in terms of obligations? Well, GATS divides obligations into general obligations, which apply across the board to all sectors, and then specific obligations, which apply to sectors in which a WTO member has made uh, a specific commitment. This is unlike the GATS, which has much, much more... Well, it's not unlike the... Uh, sorry, unlike the GATT. It is a bit like the GATT, uh, but the sorts of obligations which are for specifically negotiated sectors in uh, GATTs are taken for granted and apply across the board in GATT. And that is, for instance, non-discrimination. Non-discrimination is a big one. You need to negotiate on non-discrimination or there is nothing there. You can do whatever you like, right, in terms of national treatment anyway. What are the general obligations? There's only one really of any importance, and that is the MFN obligation. So that's non-discrimination in a horizontal sense. And everybody, all of you lawyers are going to have to get used to distinguishing between horizontal MFN type discrimination and national treatment discrimination, because of course in EU law this is all blurred. Um, but um, in, uh, in fact, quite horrifically so, no, in, uh, in Dassonville. But, um, uh, but in WTO law, this, there's a very sharp distinction between um, horizontal and say, vertical uh, non-discrimination. And MFN discrimination is um, uh, uh, applies across the board, even without having made any commitments in any sectors. Um, and that's in Article 2, Paragraph 1 of GATS. There are carve-outs from the MFN obligation, um, and some 
this was all done in 1995 following negotiations, and I'll give you, now I'll start referring to the EU schedule of concessions, which is where all the WTO members say what they're going to promise within the framework of the GATS. And it's the same for GATT with um, concessions in goods. It's basically tariffs for goods. Um, it doesn't have to be, but it is. Uh, and for GATS, um, it's obviously everything else. It's all regulatory. So uh, here are some EU exemptions. Um, Italy has an exemption for measures based upon bilateral agreements between Italy and third countries guaranteeing work permits for seasonal workers. In other words, Italy can give these work permits to countries with which it has these agreements without also having to give work permits to other um, uh, nationals of other countries. So that's an MFN exemption? Yep, it's an MFN exemption. So, so you say that most favoured nation discrimination is, is generally banned in yep. the sense that all WTO members have to be given an MFN status. That's right. That's yep, right. that's right. Um, the, the qualification on, on a permanent basis, that applies to residents as well. It says measures regarding citizenship, residence, or employment on a permanent basis. In the, uh, so, 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 well, no, well, I mean, you can interpret this as you like, because no there's, there's no authority on this, nothing. Okay. There was a committee that looked at it once and then decided not to. Anyway. <laughs> um, I think the official reason was that it's, it's all dealt with sufficiently in the commitments. <laughs> so I don't know. Your guess is good as mine. Yeah. And that's a big hole because then you can impose any measures regarding residence. Yeah. Well, I, I think lawyers play with commas just to give themselves things to do. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So I don't know. Depends who's paying you. Um, so another one, another exemption is the uh, UK for citizens of Commonwealth countries with a grandparent born in the UK. So that's a famous right of abode. There's an exception there. Um, I meet one of those conditions. And then we have, uh, this was for all sectors, but it says mainly construction and hospitality, measures based upon bilateral agreements between community member states and European and Mediterranean countries guaranteeing work permits for the purposes of temporary contract work on the basis of contracts between an employer of the third country concerned and a company in the member state concerned and which permit limited numbers of workers from the countries concerned to be employed in certain service sectors. The numbers are subject to variation according to criteria established in the agreement. It's sort of open end and fluctuate. You'd call this a variable levy if you were dealing with, uh, with goods. It's sort of like a variable levy on, um, on contract service. I mean, this would be music to the ears of the Conservative Party. This is almost like good immigration policy for them. Um, so that's sort of where we're um, uh, coming from in terms of MFN. But when there is no exemption, the MFN obligation applies across the board. So if the UK, post-Brexit, decides that it wants to let in fruit pickers from Morocco in the summertime, it also has to let in fruit pickers from everywhere else. Because the UK doesn't have the Italian exemption. Um, and won't inherit it. I, if anyone's interested, I can go on about the position of the UK in the WTO. I've been working on this for a while now, but um, anyway. There are two overarching exceptions to the MFN obligation. One is for regional trade agreements. So that's the EU at the moment. GATS shall not prevent regional trade agreements. They've got to cover substantially all service sectors to qualify. And the other is for labour market integration agreements which abolish work permits and residency requirements. So if you have a properly integrated agreement, um, you have exception. But this doesn't cover everything anyway. It only covers measures that are necessary for these types of agreement, uh, which arguably does not cover mutual recognition of qualifications, for instance. It's not necessarily necessary. Then we come to the specific obligations, and here the EU has commitments for horizontal commitments for three categories of national persons, intercorporate transferees, senior management, or important people for a company, business visitors who want to set up shop, turn up and set up shop, and then contractual service suppliers, which are employees of a juridical person. They can come for a maximum of three months a year. There's a list of sectors in which they can come, which has professional services, research and development, higher education, we'll all be pleased to hear, travel agencies and tour operators, entertainment, which probably overlaps with higher education to some degree, and then sales. <laughs> Unless there are more conditions in the 
specific schedule of services. So here I had a look at higher education and um, it's actually unbound um, apart from what I just said, except for some conditions uh, that we have and um, it may not surprise anybody to know that it is France which has some um, specific conditions. You need a contract, nine months, tops, uh, economic needs test, unless professors designated directly by minister in charge of higher education. And just to, just a cherry on top, recruiting institution must pay a tax to the International Migration Office. So that's what happens if we want to go and teach in France. And then there are overall exceptions, and this is the end of it, it's very quick. One is something that will be in Article 14 of GATS that applies to everything. Uh, be familiar to EU lawyers, although not from the services area. Um, Measures to protect public health, public morals, consumer protection and safety. It's not very interesting for the time being. More interesting is paragraph four of the annex there, which has an exception for measures necessary to... So border measures, right? This is enforcement of border measures. Then you have an exception to that, provided that such measures are not applied in such a manner as to nullify or impair benefits accruing to any member under the terms of a specific commitment... And then it says something about visas from one country versus visas uh, for... Uh, sorry, visas for nationals of one country versus visas for nationals of another country. That itself is OK. How does one interpret all of this? It's an exception. No? Shall not prevent is exceptions language. And the WTO has a very strict, much stricter, I should say, than in the EU these days, um, strict version of the necessity test. So necessity really does mean necessity. I mean, in German terms, but they take it seriously, as seems to not happen anymore in that regional agreement. And so um, this, uh, well, looking at it from that perspective, um, probably boils down to a, uh, you know, a reasonable um, uh, uh, sort of exception. Um, you, you, can look, uh, you can have your immigration controls, but you can't use them to abuse um, the commitments that you've made. So to sum up, um, the WTO doesn't give you a free trade agreement on services. Uh, it gives you a framework, apart from the MFN uh, aspect, for negotiating free trade on services. And so far, in practice, not just the EU, but most countries, but I thought I'd talk about the EU, seeing as that's going to be of most interest, um, the commitments apply pretty much to high-end white-collar and golden-collar workers, not the lower end. Um, and that is... I think, going to be the default position for the UK as well, which the EU will then benefit from, um, all of which is probably not a bad framework um, as a starting point, at least, for um, an immigration policy that dehumanises and et cetera, et cetera. But it's not to say that you can't do more. You can do more. Um, this is just the basics of what's been done so far. Thanks. Thank you very much.